All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. CP here checking in with you guys. The Minnesota Timberwolves are coming into town. And for tonight's episode, I thought it'd be appropriate to speak to a man who's covered the Minnesota beat for a number of years now. He is the senior writer at The Athletic covering the Minnesota Timberwolves as well as the Minnesota Vikings. And he is John Krosinski. John, how you doing today, man? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing great, CP. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. And, and uh, as I said, the, the last place Minnesota Timberwolves are, are coming into the garden to visit an old friend in Tom Thibodeau and the 14 and 16 New York Knicks. What's been your impression of this Knicks team thus far in the season? Yeah, I mean, watching from afar, I mean, it, it has been impressive to see the way that I, I think that they've embraced what Tom Thibodeau wants to do. And he wants a hard playing, hard nosed group that that, you know, just gives its all night in and night out. And I think you know, he's been able to get that a lot with that group. And I think especially in the Eastern Conference, if you can get a team to just really play hard night in and night out, it can be a big benefit for you. Julius Randle's been amazing, obviously. You know, R.J. Barrett's making some strides. Um, but all in all, I think the the thing that stands out is when you go into a game against the Knicks, you know that you know, they're going to fight you. And, and that's the Tom Thibodeau style right there. And, um, you know, it, that in the Eastern Conference, that can go a long way. And um, so, so far, so good there. Um, and you know, that's, I think the mentality part of it is just such a big part of the Tom Thibodeau experience that if you get guys that do embrace that, uh, you know, they can, you, you can have success because Tibbs is a really, really good coach. It's just, you have to get the right people yeah in with him that buy all the way in and then you can have some success with it it's been a pleasant surprise man as someone who covers the team all 82 games and two years ago they went 17 games last year 21 it's been a pleasant surprise to see them sitting here won two games under 500 seventh place in the east and uh in an east that you know is very tight they can be as, as close as fourth within a game and a half or as far back as 13th. So it's a tight race, but as you said, every game I just feel like they're going in there ready to compete and ready to win. And much they're much more cohesive, much more together, and it just seems like they're much way more prepared than under previous regimes. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about Tibbs is that under his hire, the opinions amongst the fan base were so polarizing. You know, some loved it. Some hated it. And then there were some like me who were more cautiously optimistic uh, because of the way things ended in Minnesota and certainly the way his reputation kind of preceded him. Why do you th what do you think was the, the main reason why he was fired from the Timberwolves? Yeah, I mean, the main factor was is that his main guy, the guy that he really kind of staked the future of the franchise to, Jimmy Butler, really blew things up from in inside the house. And so I, any executive that goes through that kind of a situation with a star player is going to have a hard time surviving it. And I think that no one ever doubted Tibbs, the coach, Tibbs, the preparer, Tibbs, the worker, like he, all of that was as advertised in Minnesota. Um, you know, he is his commitment to the job and all of those things unquestioned. There's no, you know, his acumen, his knowledge of the game, his knowledge of the league. There's there's no one, you know, that has more of it than than Tibbs does. I think that the problem that he ran into was that uh the the dual roles of being the president of basketball operations and a head coach just wasn't gonna work for him. Uh it, you know, you when you have a guy like Tibbs who is a grinder and is, you know, kind of this really, uh, you know, this tight personality that um, that is so intense and is so based on the work. Uh, I think you need to have someone else to sort of balance that out. Um, and and you, you need a GM or you need an assistant coach or you need some other element to kind of lighten the air a little bit to be kind of approachable with players and to be engaging one-on-one -on -one with them and things like that. That's just not Tibbs deal. And so um, as his role as president of basketball operations uh, and, and kind of really lording over the franchise, the entire franchise kind of took on his level of intensity. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if you want to call it paranoia, whatever you want to call it in terms of just, 
the way that he was a, a hermit and he really kind of was an isolationist type of a of, of a personality that way. And so when it came time for uh, him to need some allies within the organization to go to bat for him, when the Butler thing was blowing up in his face, he had not cultivated those relationships mm -hmm. and he didn't have a lot of those people in his corner. And so, um, you know, I think in, in New York, it's a lot different with Leon Rose and World Wide West and and, and Kenny Payne and a lot of guys, they have really surrounded Tibbs with the right people to kind of balance everything out. I mean, you know, Tibbs is a great coach with a great personality for coaching and winning that day. Mm -hmm. You also need the people around to really cultivate a culture and, and, and keep everyone from just feeling the weight of competition every single night. And so uh, they, they just didn't have that in Minnesota. If he, if Tibbs would have just been the coach and actually had a real GM that, that could help with a lot of those things um, and have, be a little more forward thinking, I, I think it could have worked out differently, but that just wasn't the case here. Yeah, certainly. Because I mean, he, he gets there first year was a struggle. Second year, they make the playoffs mm -hmm. first time in ages. And then only does half a season his third year before he's ousted. And so, as you said, it seems like obviously the Butler thing was what was out there in, in public view. And that, you know, certainly could have led to his demise. But when you, when you mentioned Leon Rose, I saw the same thing in terms of how he kind of crafted the staff in terms of bringing in a Kenny Payne who was known to, yes, be a, a player development coach, but a coach that had great relationship with that Kentucky, um, with those Kentucky prospects. You talk about Mike Woodson, who, you know, I brought in players from Jamal Crawford, Raymond Felton, Kenny Martin. Everybody goes to bat for Mike Woodson as being a player coach, but a guy that, you know, holds players accountable and will still get the most out of you. A World Wide West who also has those, those player relationships. And so it seems like Leon Rose comes coming from the player agent side of things kind of, you know, knows what the players want, knows what they need to succeed. And it seemed like he shaped the staff that way and bringing on those three guys. Yeah, it was really smart. And I think I wrote a piece for the athletic right before, right after Tibbs was hired about just how key Leon Rose was going to be in this, in this uh, situation, because I'll tell you like one of the things that I did not agree with, with the Timberwolves in the way that things went with, Tom Thibodeau was they hired Tom to come in they empowered him you know greatly and then you know they kind of saw like how volatile he is on the sideline and kind of how isolationist he is behind the scenes he doesn't want to do a lot of the marketing and branding things he doesn't want to meet with season ticket holders he doesn't want to you know kiss babies and and you know shake hands like a politician that's just not his gig and I think that the Wolves for whatever reason, we're a little bit surprised by that or put off by that. And it's like, look, it's not hard to find out who Tom Thibodeau is. And if you are surprised by that part of the thing, by his personality that way, then you didn't do a good job of researching who you were hiring. Yeah. And so Leon Rose really knows Tibbs. I mean, he was his agent for a long time. He um, really kind of went through the battles in Minnesota with Tibbs because he also represents Carl Anthony Towns. And so he knew all, all of the skeletons in the closet for this Timberwolves situation. And so when he hired Tibbs, he very much understood where are the blind spots? How do I make sure that we craft a, a, an ecosystem where we can really maximize Tibbs' great gifts with game plan, with preparation, with with understanding of uh, of the league, with with all of those things, with play, with uh, skill development and maximization of his players, like Tibbs can do all of that stuff. But you need to have those other things around him. You need to have the 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 relationship building. You need to have kind of the pol the pol the politicians on you know in the organization as well to really kind of help smooth over the eventual rough edges that are always going to come. And so they just did not have that here. Tibbs' staff here coaching was just all Tibbs guys, mm -hmm. like except for Ryan Saunders, who was kind of a prerequisite, right. but um, they were all Tibbs guys. The front office was all Tibbs guys. And there just wasn't anybody who was going to say, hey, Tom, you know, we got a problem here with Jimmy Butler. We got to address this some way. We got a problem here. We got to, we got to reach out and, and, and kind of, 
be a little bit different with Ricky Rubio or Carl Anthony Towns than we are with Jimmy Butler or Taj Gibson or Derrick Rose. Like we got to figure out ways to approach that. And they just never did. And so when they went about it that way, then the locker room itself just was not able to come together and was not able to stay together because any little kind of brush fires that started, no one was there to put them out before they became really big infernos. I think in New York, with everyone around him there, you have people that will see problems around the corner before they become real problems. And that's just not Tibbs' strength. All Tibbs wants to do is clock in every day, put your work in, and then go home. And um, he's not there for for the touchy feely. How you know you know how's a player feeling today? Oh, does this player doesn't get along with this player? Um, boy, let's get in a room and hash it out. He's not doing that. He just, re- he depends on people to be professional and just handle it. And that's not the way it works in the NBA these days. So um, in Minnesota, all of those fires that were just little sparks turned into raging infernos because there was no one there to really address it. And I think Leon and World Wide West and Kenny and Woodson and all of, and, and so many other people there, they're just more prepared for that side of it. So Tom can just be the coach and that's what he's best at. And he's still able to have his guys and Andy Greer and, and Daisuke as well. But sure. it, as you said, it seems like the, the major change there was Leon able to bring in guys that may cover Tibbs' weaknesses in certain areas, relationships being one of them. And then I also look at, how he changed potentially as a person because I, I heard Julius Randle's a podcast interview with JJ Reddick and and he had some glowing things to say about Tibbs. You know, really uh, went to bat for the Tibbs hire. He thought that Tibbs was the perfect coach to push him and hold him accountable. Even called Tibbs soft. He said he was more of a player's coach. And, and Julius Randle, who's having an All Star year, actually went on to say that this is the most fun he's ever had. Um, playing and so it's just very interesting to see you know how Tibbs has maybe changed in the way he handles the players based on what happened in Minnesota we know that Towns wasn't too much of a fan of his and then obviously the Butler situation kind of spiraling out of control yeah and I think I think that there has always been a misconception about Tibbs in terms of because when you watch him on the sideline he is you know, just a raving lunatic sometimes the way that he just yells at refs and he's screaming and hollering and things. And you look at him, you're like, man, this guy must just be a nightmare (laughs) to deal with behind the scenes. He's really not like with the media, with players, like he is very um, kind of, he's quiet Mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Uh, He doesn't, you know, have a hot temper that flies off of the handle um, when he's, when he's interacting with players or, or media, if he's, if he's asked tough questions, he doesn't take it personally or, or anything like that. Um, So he has a very good temperament off of the court. It's just that in the heat of the battle, that's when, you know, it, it, it changes a lot. So like, I mean, like an Andrew Wiggins, who is very kind of soft spoken, mild mannered, um, Tibbs wasn't riding him and wasn't just like, you know, browbeating him in practice or anything like that. I, I watched it like after practices and stuff, they would have very, you know, quiet, um, substantive conversations about the game, about what Tibbs wanted from him and things like that. So I think it's more of just for Tibbs, he would, they would go to practice. He'd have his conversations with guys that he would, he would, he would impart what he wants. And then he'd go to his office and watch film and just obsess over that. Mm. But there, he, he really depended on guys to just kind of be adults and, and, and handle their own business. And sometimes that's, you, you can do that sometimes in the NBA world. um, It's impossible to avoid some of those other things. So like Randall, I think right now is in a perfect point in his career for Tibbs. Like he had gone through some, um, you know, lack of success, both from a team aspect and from an individual standpoint. He's, you know, what is seventh year in the league now? Uh, he's he's 26 years old. And so I think like a player like that can really um, benefit from Tibbs because I think that Julius Randle understood that there are some things that he needed to change and yeah. fix mm-hmm. in his own game um to to really take the next step and he was at a point where his career was at a little bit of a crossroads is he going to be a guy that you can really rely on as a starter main focal point of your team or is he going to be a guy that bounces around 
from team to team for the rest of his career. Maybe he's a bench guy, you know, he's there for a year or two and that's it. And so I think Tibbs came along at the right point of his career. And the key thing has been, they have had some success now early to underscore that, Um, you know, Randall's playing awesome. The team is 14 and 16. It's not like they're lighting the world on fire, but they're a lot more competitive than they were. were, Yeah. Yeah, you need that kind of positive reinforcement for what they're doing. One of the issues with the Timberwolves was they did not have a good year hit Tibbs first year with Towns and Wiggins and Levine. It just it, it didn't all work out. And so I think that there might have been a little bit of you know, the, the good tides and the good feelings that he has gotten from New York because there has been some early success. It wasn't here in Minnesota. So he didn't have that foundation, even when he made big changes for year two and got to the playoffs. You know, there was still a little bit of like, OK, is, is this the, the the genius that we've been told about? And so, you know, there's plenty of reasons for that. But they just you know, they only won two more games the Tibbs first year as than they did the previous year under Sam Mitchell. So they were expecting a much bigger leap and it just didn't happen. How much of that success between those first two years in Minnesota, because now the debate, even in New York now, is how he's playing the vets and how he's focusing on player development. You know, how much of that success that second year was him kind of leaning on a Jimmy Butler and then bringing in D Rose like he did mm-hmm. uh, this year, bringing back Taj and you know Timber Bulls as they called them. <laughs> What's your take on, on that? Yeah, I mean the for, it's funny because he took over when he was hired. It was hey, here comes this super established coach. And this no nonsense guy who is going to help one of the maybe at the time, the Timberwolves were a very kind of growth stock. And you thought, okay, with Towns and Wiggins and Levine and Rubio, all young guys, like maybe this is just the coach that they need to help them take the next step and really kind of expedite their learning curve and become, you know, a really a force to be reckoned with in the West. So they, you know, that, that was the narrative when Tom, came right into town well then they did not have that success the first year and tom didn't wait around he changed everything like they went for overnight they went from a young team that was kind of on a two to three year trajectory to an absolutely put all our chips in the middle of the table and win right now team it was you brought in um jimmy butler you brought in Derek rose you brought in taj gibson you brought in jamal crawford you just brought in all of this, uh, Luol Deng, mm-hmm. you, you brought in all all of this really super veteran talent because that's those are the guys that appreciated Tibbs and like understood that this is kind of what it takes for some teams to be successful is you got to commit to the grind and you got to be all in this way. And so he needed help in that locker room to convince people like, yeah, no, this guy really knows what he's talking about. We have to listen to him. And so you know, they, um, so they changed the whole identity of the team from year one to year two, and they did get to the playoffs. And that was a very good thing because the the franchise hadn't been there since 2004. And so it really got a monkey off of their back. But I do think one, you know, thing that is lamented here um, since he's been gone is that, yeah, they, you know, they got to the playoffs great, but they put all their chips in the middle of the table when the Warriors were at the height of their powers. Like, what were you ever going to do? What was realistic there? And now all of that is gone. And so they still have Towns um, and they had Wiggins and they traded him last year, but it really kind of changed everything and and, and forced a, a new reset and a new rebuild probably quicker than anybody ever anticipated when, you know, if they would have held on to Levine, maybe that changes things um, and and for the long term. But just the way that the, because Jimmy Butler only spent a year and, you know, change here, like that was just crippling for Tom Thibodeau here for this franchise because they put all his all their eggs in his basket. And when he pulled the ripcord, um, you know, it just it was so much dysfunction. It was so much um you know, trouble that they're still digging out of it, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's interesting because as you look at it now and they're sitting at 14 and 16, um, they're competing, 
You have some young players contributing. Obviously, R.J. Barrett's getting his fair share of minutes. Mitchell Robinson as well. Emmanuel quickly sixth on the team in minutes. So the younger guys are playing. But then you have your your other draft picks like uh, Kevin Knox or Frank Nilakina who have been buried on the bench. And Thibodeau calls it they'll be in in situational moments. But they've been kind of buried behind the Reggie Bullocks, the Alec Burks, and the Austin Rivers who – just you know, just got here and and have logged considerable minutes ahead of those guys. So it's an interesting debate in how they continue this because yes, there's some of the fan base that want them to push for the playoffs, and we know Tibbs wants to win, but we also want to see these kids developing. So it, it's a it's a fine line that I think it's not you know clear yet how far along these kids are. Obviously, he just got here, but something to to watch you know for the future and. How, what will the true focus on player development be as he, you know, continues to try to win right now? Well, yeah, and I'll tell you, like, there's been a lot of people here in Minnesota who have kind of smiled when they saw how long did it take for him to get Derrick Rose in there? <laughs> not right. very long. Taj Gibson was coming along. I guess not we should have been when surprised he, at that one. Yeah, he, he, he's looking at that and saying, okay, I got some guys I can work with, but some of these kids, man, yeah. it, this, this ain't going to work. And you've already heard him, too, talk a lot about the need for a star, right? Like, they that's, that's a big thing, and he's right about that. But I think Tom – Thibodeau is not your coach to take a bunch of young kids, put them together and let them grow and develop right. and, and ease over time. That's not who he is. Yeah. He's here to win and win right now. And he does not care if what it takes to do that. If you are, you know, Kevin Knox and your feelings are hurt because um, you're not getting 30 minutes a night to develop your talent, he's going to say, well, play better. And then you'll get that time. Um, you know, and, and you, Hey, Taj Gibson is here because in part, because some of you guys, he loves his favorite mantra is do your job. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do your job, um, he's not going to wait around for you. And, you know, I think that, you know, you've heard a little bit, well, should quickly start and things like that. And part of it is, is like, he's not a guy that puts a lot of trust in really young yeah. players. Like that's not, you know, he knows that veterans win in this league and he's here to win. And so, if Knicks fans are expecting, you know, him to turn this roster into a petri dish of young talent that grows over time and blossoms in year four, five, or six, maybe you get that with Barrett. Maybe you do get that with Quickly, but you're not going to get that with a ton of guys. Yeah. Like, and he's going to be pushing Leon Rose to put some of these young guys in a package to go get Bradley Beal or whoever it is. You know, any veteran that he can get in that's really established and is going to come in and help them right away. Cause that's just, that's his philosophy. That's his mindset. Um, that's why he traded Zach Levine mm -hmm. without hesitation because um, Levine was coming off of an ACL and wasn't going to be able to help them at all for much of that second year. And he really wanted Jimmy Butler. Um, and, and so it, he didn't hesitate at all to do that. Um, He's he's not going to sit around and wait for for these guys, and so he's going to you know play the veterans, and he's going to play them really big minutes, and he's going to try and squeeze every single win out of this roster that he possibly can. You know, with Ob Toppin, it's it's just very interesting because the dynamic with Randall is something that they play the same position, so his minutes have have come sparingly, but even when he's in the game. Uh, whether he's hot or he's not, Tibbs has a very, very short rope on him, and it's it's usually maybe 10 minutes a game tops before Toppin is gone. Quickly, on the other hand, he's, he's getting his chances. He's leading the team with, um, since the Rose trade, we were wondering how that was going to impact him, but he's leading the team in fourth quarter minutes at 10. And so you can see that Tibbs, he wants guys that are ready to go and ready to go right now. It just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like he has the patience to put on the training wheels and let them play through mistakes because if that impacts them winning, he's, he's not going to put them in. So it's just interesting to see because this team has, they have two first round picks this coming draft and a second, a, a high second, more in the future. So it just, it's interesting to see, you know, how many kids they will actually field and develop and how they will try to maybe package it and maybe try to get a Beal or somebody like that in the future. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be really surprised to see them not use some of those picks to try and go get someone. Yeah. And um, and that, that's just what Tibbs is going to do. And, uh, you know, especially right now, you, you look at Toppin, um, who is a little older rookie, and so you'd hope that he would get a little more time. And it was the same thing 
here in his first season when he took Chris Dunn, um, who was an older rookie over guys like Jamal Murray and, and, and a few others that were younger, he took, you know, they part and part of the reason that they took Chris Dunn. And I think maybe a little bit of the reason they took Obi Toppin is, Hey, he's a little older. Maybe he'll be a little bit more mature and ready for what Tibbs wants of him. But Chris Dunn didn't work out very well for him. And, you know, who knows with Obi Toppin, it's still so early. You never know with that, but um, he Tibbs is not going to gift him minutes to try and say, okay, we need, we need him to develop. We need him to find his way. That's not going to happen, especially with Julius playing as well as he is. And especially with them right in the thick of the playoff picture, like there's no way that he's going to sacrifice the, uh, what he might think is a possibility of a win Mm -hmm. um, to give top in 28 or 30 minutes and, and and just develop. And so uh, that's going to be a delicate line for the whole organization to walk. And, um, but yeah, like, you know, they're not going to, I, I would be shocked if they have an influx of young players over the next year or two with those picks, they're going to have to try and move some of that to try and bring in whoever it is just, you know, that's the only way that the Tibbs system and philosophy will work. You, you mentioned Randall and, and we talked about the minutes earlier and that's, that was another thing when Tibbs came in, you know, having that reputation, the, the reaction by the, by NBA Twitter was, you know, good luck RJ. He's going to run him into the ground and Mitchell Robinson's doomed. And you know, Julius is doomed. Julius currently leading the league in minutes played RJ sixth. Julius currently second in minutes per game. Personally, I haven't seen, you know, any issues with it. I, I spoke to Jamal Crawford about the situation. He said, listen, guys want to play. Uh, he himself didn't play that much in Minnesota, but he said, you know, guys right. want to play. When you cover the team under Tibbs, what was your observation with the way he kind of managed the team in terms of minutes? Yeah, I'll, you know, I will say this. Um, he, I mean, Wiggins, Towns, Butler all played a, a lot of minutes. There's no doubt about that. Um, but, you know, my friends in the New York media kind of would, ch- you know, chide the quote unquote minutes police and Jeff Van Gundy would say it on, on, on TV and stuff. But I can tell you unequivocally in his time, in Tibbs time here in Minnesota, he was not confronted with much pushback from the media about how, how come you're playing these guys so long? It, it came up a little bit here and there. We would ask, Hey, you know, what do you think about this? But he was never criticized for it. The only time it really ever was a subject was when Jimmy would just kind of sort of jokingly say, man, I'm playing too many minutes. Tibbs got to back off a little bit, but it was, it was kind of a joke, but like for, uh, for me, at least personally, I mean, the, your best players in the NBA play 37 minutes. I mean, LeBron James is playing 38 minutes a night right now in year 18. Um, James, James Harden, you know, go on down the list of, of your very best players. You know, Giannis didn't play, you know, 38 minutes and, you know, he probably didn't play enough uh, for the Bucks, frankly, uh, last year. And, and so, um, you know, the idea that um, there's this huge cabal that is criticizing Tibbs, especially in Minnesota for playing guys too much. I mean, that's just not the case. I mean, you know, um, I, I don't blame him at all for playing Julius Randle as much as he did. Now, we will see as the season goes along, especially this year where the compressed schedule is you're playing night after night after night, if it does wear these guys down a little bit towards the end of the season, we'll see about that. But um, in Minnesota, when he was here, yes, Andrew Wiggins, Towns, and Butler were all in like the top 15 of minutes played. But guess what? They needed those guys to play yeah. in the Western Conference. It was so important to get as many wins as you could that I don't think anybody was mad at him here for that. So, um, you know, it's, it is it is something. I mean, I think it stems a little bit more from the Chicago days where Luol and mm-hmm. Joe Kim Noah and really got seemed to get worn down um, and their careers may have been shortened a little bit by how things were handled, but here in Minnesota, that was never a problem for, for anyone here. As I look at this matchup between the two teams on Sunday, um, obviously the, the big dogs, the, the matchup between Randall and Carl Anthony town bears watching, but I also, uh, I'm intrigued about the matchup on the wings and in particular, Anthony Edwards, um, the rookie uh, coming out of Georgia. Now he's had his typical peaks and valleys of a rookie, but this month he's coming on hot. I think he's averaging about 16.4 points per game. And what have you seen is the biggest improvement in his game uh, since he's come in? 
Yeah, he so since D'Angelo Russell has gone out, um, they have really moved to put Anthony Edwards as the primary playmaker for the offense. And I think that just fits what he does a lot better. I mean, in, he started the season coming off the bench and he was kind of the the number one score with the second unit. Um, and, and, and they were trying to bring him on a little slowly because, you know, they didn't have a training camp really. They didn't have much preseason, no summer league. So they wanted to ease him into things. And so um, they, he started out that way. wasn't, you know, he wasn't making a lot of shots and he was not scoring. He was getting to the rim, but not converting. And really in the last five to six games, really in the month of February, now he's, when he's getting to the rim, he's finishing or getting fouled. And so that's a huge thing for Anthony Edwards because the dude is just so strong and physically imposing that he can get by most defenders on the perimeter pretty easily. And he uses his body at the rim to invite contact, kind of puts a shoulder into a big to get a little space, and then he can get his shot off and lay it up and in. And he has been converting those in traffic drives a lot better. He's shooting from the three a little bit better as well. I think he's up over 30% in February where he was in the 20s. Um, in uh in, in january getting a little bit better shots now that towns is back mm -hmm. and so he's getting better open looks and his catch and shoot numbers are really good so he can do it that way but really what you see most is he has the ball in his hands now and he's a lot more comfortable kind of being able to go to the basket or make plays for others and he's really coming along he's been really really good the last you know two weeks or so especially and it seems like he's kind of finding his his legs a little bit and 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 understanding this league and what he can do. And, um, you know, he's got all the athleticism in the world. And so he's been fun to watch. Coming on strong. I, I watched that Laker game and he was he was pretty good. Twenty eight points in that Laker game. Now, on the other side, on the other wing, you have Malik Beasley. He's averaging yeah. career highs, 20.9 points per game, almost 40 percent from three on eight attempts. He was a guy, man, that I really wanted the Knicks to look at. And I did hear uh, from my sources that there was legitimate interest in, in Malik Beasley. They were basically looking at Beasley and Gordon Hayward um, in their pursuits. Um, what did you hear about uh, how that offseason went for him and, and how he ultimately chose the Timberwolves? Yeah, so um, you know, he was a restricted free agent uh, when when he came out. He played when he, he came over in the deal from Denver in February of last year. And he was not playing much for the Nuggets the Wolves thought that he could do more and they put him right into the starting lineup and he played incredibly well. He shot, I think 44% from three over that 14 game span before the season ended um, really gave them a boost there. Now, then he becomes a restricted free agent gets into some legal issues off of the court. Um, and, and so a lot, a lot of people wondered, is that really going to drive his price down in the negotiations? And it turned out that, you know, they, the Wolves met with him right away as soon as the market opened, signed him to a four-year, $60 million deal. So only three of those years is guaranteed, so it's essentially 345 ish mm -hmm. But you saw that number and you're thinking, holy cow, like that's a lot more than maybe I thought he was going to get. But one thing in my reporting uh, of it was that they believed that had they not kind of, you know, splashed the pot right away that the Knicks were going to come after him with a big number yeah. and that you know they, that Tom Thibodeau really thought he would fit with Tom Thibodeau he's a super intense guy incredibly hard worker um and you know just a nice shooter and a dynamic scorer from the wing and so there was a real internal belief from the Wolves that the Knicks were waiting in the wings they were just I think starting with Gordon Hayward and seeing if they could get there before they yeah. turned their eyes to Malik Beasley and so the Wolves wanted to get a deal done before the Knicks could come in and kind of mess with their offers. And um, so the, the Wolves locked him in that night. And you looked at it and said, e, did they overpay? But really, since he has started this season, it has not been an overpay. Yeah. He's been worth every he's penny. Yep, the way he's shooting, the way he's scoring, he's the most consistent guy that they can rely on night in and night out. He stays healthy. He's in great shape. Uh, he needs to help work on his defense, but overall, um, they love what they're getting from him, and he's, um, yeah, he's absolutely living up to that contract. Uh, very interesting indeed, and and I know, you know, with the legal trouble and everything, it's a risky bet, but when I looked at that deal, I said, okay, 
Minnesota had to have done some research. They had to have known that a, a plea agreement was coming and that he was going to avoid serious, serious jail time. And I'm sure when they gave him that contract, maybe they said, you know, he, he's a guy that he made a mistake and that he should rebound. I, I would have rolled that dice if I was the Knicks brain trust, man. I really would have because he's such a talent, man. So, yeah, so and I, I think they're still bracing for some sort of suspension yeah. um, eventually. But I think the thinking is it might be ar- around the five game area and you can live with that. Right. As long as, you know, he, you know, the message is delivered and he keeps his nose clean off the court, because as long as he stays, you know, in in good standing with the league and with and with the authorities, um, what you're what he's giving you on on the court on a nightly basis is absolutely essential for what they want to do going forward. He's still 24 years old. He's very young, um, hasn't even entered his prime yet. So they feel really good about that. Last question for you, as we deal with real life and and the effects of the pandemic and the coronavirus, it it certainly ravaged that Timberwolves team. I mean, Carl Anthony Towns, man, my heart goes out to him having lost his mom to the virus and contracting it himself. You know, members of the team contracting it, you had games postponed. What's been the impact um, of the pandemic on that team as you covered it? And and how's that impacted you in in covering the team and not being able to, to attend in person? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I'll start with the least important thing first, but for me, um, covering the team, yeah, it's been different. We, we're not able to go into the locker rooms. We're not able to be face-to-face with these guys and really kind of work on our rapport and our relationships and build trust that way and 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 things like that. So it makes it harder to kind of do the job just, you know, on Zoom interviews and 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 kind of get a connection with guys and, and, and really tell their stories. Um, we do the best we can, but uh, but that's just the nature of the beast right now um, with with what we have to do with the protocols. I mean, for the Timberwolves, from the team's pr- perspective, you're exactly right. I mean, it's been they've been hit hard by it in more ways than one, because you have towns who lost his mother, has lost several other close people, including some relatives to COVID. And so he came into this season. I mean, he's your franchise guy, like he's the one that the whole thing is built around. And you know, he you know, admitted to us that his thoughts aren't really totally locked in on basketball right now. And, you know, he's dealt with so much grief and so much heartache that, um, you know, that he has not been able to focus fully on the job. And that that affects what the team can do on the court. Then you get into the season and he first injures his wrist and misses a bunch of games with that. And then as soon as he comes back from the wrist, he plays like one or two games and then he gets COVID and he's out for another almost a month. Mm. And so what it's been is that this whole team relies so much on what he can do defensively and offensively. And you take that away for the vast majority of the season. And then you get what you get. They're seven and 21. Um, They just, they lost a ton of games while he was out because they looked frankly quite lost Mm. Without him, then you have Juan Hernan Gomez, Ricky Rubio were, were both out with with either either COVID itself or quarantine because of it, and um, and so they've just never had their full team together to see exactly what they have. And even now, now Towns comes back and D'Angelo Russell is, is is out, and they've played five games together in a year, and and so it's just really been you know, a series of misfortunes and bad luck and heartache and heartbreak that has prevented this thing from getting going. I mean, they are playing better of late with towns back in the lineup and they're being very competitive. They're not winning a lot, but they're, but they're competitive, but still you look at it and you say, we don't know what this team is. We don't know if they're really good with Russell and Towns. We don't know if they're really bad, if that wouldn't work out. It just, there's so much uncertainty. And that's been, I think, the biggest frustration for Wolves Brass is they look at it and they say, yeah, we're seven and 21, but we haven't had so much, so many of our important pieces that it's unfair to really evaluate it that way. And yeah. so that's, it's been just a real challenge to try and extrapolate what this team could be if you even had some things go right when pretty much everything has gone wrong for them from a health and and, and injury standpoint. 
Certainly bears watching. And as you said, the talent to go around, you know, with, with Edwards and Beasley and D'Lo at the time and Carl Anthony Town. So uh, we'll see what happens when they collide with Tom Thibodeau and those New York Knicks at MSG. But, uh, John, I really appreciate the time you gave us today and all the gems that you dropped. Um, best of health to you and, and success as well in your endeavors. Thanks again for joining us, and hopefully we could do this again. Absolutely, CP. You enjoy these Knicks. It's nice to see them relevant again for once, it's, right? It's a beautiful day, man. It's a beautiful feeling. John, thanks again, man. All right, take care.